So again, let me thank you all for joining us today. And please, uh, let's welcome our first panel, Organizing for National Security Policy, which will be moderated by Ambassador David Abshire, President of the, Pres uh, President of the Center for the Study of the Presidency. Thanks very much. If my additional panelists would please join me. I don't want to feel lonely. I want to first congratulate uh, Ambassador President uh, Dick Solomon uh, for his, as Max Kampelman said, his, his splendid leadership of this institution. He's been a great institution builder. And also on the very fine op-ed piece that, uh, timely indeed, that he and Chet Crocker uh, had in the morning paper. And of course, uh, uh, Max Kampelman is the wisest of the wise men, no question about it. Now, passing the baton, how do we prepare ourselves strategically for the 21st century? Uh, you know, the last real strategic overhaul we had, basic overhaul, was when General Eisenhower became president because he thought strategically. He brought in George Marshall as his, as his, as his advisor and did the solarium exercise, a, a basic reassessment. And out of these things, he de devised really a grand strategy, a conceptual framework, long haul, far more than military, even balanced budgets and and trade, and uh, the battle of ideas, the radios, USIA, it was, it was a total uh, concept, and, and we're still resting on part of that machinery. It's interesting, on the NSC, he had a strategic planning board to be anticipatory that would not be sucked into the day-to-day -day crises. Today, it seems to me that another, a new re revitalization is needed as we move into the 21st century. The resource challenge, the strategic resource challenge is enormous. And in a sense, the enemy, if you're going to net assess, is us, how we are organized or disorganized because of our great compartmentalization in the executive and legislative branches to meet these very different strategic challenges. I say, stealing from Isaiah Berlin, we've moved from the mind of the hedgehog to the mind of the, of the fox. It's an entirely different, it's a strategic inversion. We're intervening four times more than during the Cold War. Congressional Budget Office says we've either got to cut our military forces 25 percent or increase 50 billion, which is more than a year, which is more than any candidate uh, uh, indicated. We're funding, and if we don't think the fire brigade is adequately agile, we're, we're funding the fire brigade 16 to 1 to the fire prevention, which is the State Department and, and allied groups. That's inconceivable. The people in the Pentagon, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and others have made that observation to me. To complicate things more, although Eisenhower saw this, today's strategy is as much financial as it is political military, and the new technologies are driving the financial and are driving the political military. We can lose democracies overseas through a financial crisis quicker than a military crisis, and the financial can bring on the military. So we've, we've got to be, strategy is synergistic. We've got to learn to re relate these things and break down this compartmentalization. And fortunately for us, we have a brilliant, experienced panel this morning to address these minor questions. Uh, I'm not answering them. They are. We, I'm going to eliminate 90 percent of the introductions of these gentlemen because I would be introducing them all morning if I took everything that they have accomplished. Uh, I have a tremendous admiration for all of them as, as, as individuals as thinkers and leaders. Lieutenant General Brent Scowcroft is the only NSC advisor in history that has repeated it. And that, that is uh, ably serving uh, two presidents and being a leading light on more bipartisan commissions that have broken deadlocks than, than I have, would have the time to, to mention. And he co-authored with George Bush that uh, fine book, A World Transformed, and we're a little bit at the anniversary of the Gulf uh, War, uh, Desert 
storm, Brent, I think it was yesterday. Um, and among other things, uh, if, if you would, how you view this strategic integration and also the role of the president. Now, we've got a new president, a new vice president, a new team. Uh, the last president has been very involved as, as a negotiator in, in Northern Ireland, Middle East. How you view these these roles, and um, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you very much, Dave. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning and to kick off this day-long discussion about passing the baton. <coughs> uh, I wrestled with what I ought to talk about. Uh, and decided I would not talk about substance, but talk about process. And I'm going to look briefly at three different questions. Uh, first is, how does the NSC differ from the departments and agencies of the executive branch? What does it mean serving the president? And then just a word about organization and procedures. There's been a lot of discussion about the NSC and its many incarnations, and uh, while it still has many of the roots put in place by President Eisenhower and the first real national security advisor, Andy Goodpaster, sitting back there, uh, it has changed and it's never exactly the same. But the kinds of things it does are similar. The, dis the role of the NSC, I think, can be described in one word, and that is integrate. As Dave mentioned, we have a stovepipe system of government. Each particular agency, be it geographical or functional, goes up through itself and ends in the president. And the president is, by our Constitution, the integrator. He has a cabinet, but we have never had cabinet government in a manner uh, that a parliamentary government does. And that's where the integration takes place in a parliamentary system. So what we have had to do with the press of the modern age on the presidency is to provide an informal means for national security, at least, of integrating the diplomatic, the military, the informational, so that the president can look at issues, the vital issues of life and death for the country as a whole. And that's fundamentally how the NSC differs from the agencies. Uh, his principal advisors, the presidents, are the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense. The National Security Advisor is an advisor. He is the only one with no other responsibilities than his advice to the president. The cabinet officers have multiple responsibilities. They run great bureaucracies, and those bureaucracies have a life and soul of their own. And the secretary has to lead them, but also be responsive to them. And the, so there is an ethic. There's an ethic that goes with the State Department, with the Defense Department, with the Treasury Department. The cabinet officer also has a responsibility to the Congress, who has oversight over his department. He also has a public responsibility to explain what his department is doing, what their policies are, and so on. The National Security Advisor has none of those. 
His only responsibility is to serve the president. Now, the difference here is very important. And the National Security Council has to remind itself that it is not a cabinet department. It is not an agency. It is a group of advisors who try to integrate the policies developed by the diplomatic, the military, the finance, and so on, and provide the president an integrated view. Uh, NSCs have tried to, in the past, to replace some of the executive departments. Indeed, Richard Nixon who in fact is responsible for the general organization of the NSC, which has been fairly constant since then, uh, didn't trust the State Department. He wanted to run foreign policy from the White House, and he chose as Secretary of State a dear friend who knew nothing about foreign policy because he wanted his national security advisor to uh, run the foreign policy. That uh, is an aberration. The NSC should not try to replicate the departments. They shouldn't do the basic studies out of which policy comes. They should not execute the policies. The executive branches, executive means execute. And it is when you step over these lines that problem problems uh, occur. Uh, serving the president, one of the most valuable aspects of any presidency is his time. There is nothing more precious than the president's time. And there is not, no more important task that the National Security Advisor has than using that time wisely and as sparingly as necessary. Meetings, what kind of meetings does the president have to attend? How much work can be done beforehand to resolve the issues so that you don't have a three hour meeting, you can have a 30 minute meeting. Uh, visitors, who gets to see the president? Everybody wants to see the president. Who should and on what kind of conditions? How much does the president need to read? How much does he need to take home at night, sitting in the Lincoln bedroom, his office, wherever he does his work? All those are very important, very important issues. And in, in it all, the National Security Advisor, if he's to be successful, has to be an honest broker. And that is, he has to have the faith of the cabinet officers who do not see the president as often as a national security advisor, that he is giving them an honest shake and not trying to carve up the decisions in a way which the national security advisor feels is best. Because if he does not appear as the honest broker, the cabinet officers will insist on every issue to see the president personally and the whole system will grind to a halt. Now, one of the recurring problems had been conflicts, especially among national security advisors and secretaries of state, although they have been among different members of the top team. Most of those conflicts come over the job of who should be the explicator of American foreign, uh, foreign and security policy. And with a few exceptions, they should be the president and the cabinet secretaries. And the national security advisor should be seen occasionally and heard even less. Uh, it is not his job to explain to the American people what foreign policy is. 
what military policy is. It's important that the American people know who this person is and how he thinks and how he looks and how he acts. But his job is to advise the president, basically not the American people. Uh, operational aspects. Should the NSC be involved in operations? I think the answer is clearly no, but there are some circumstances in which all profit by an operational role. If, for example, you have a very important mission and you wish to convey personally the president's views to a foreign leader, but you want it done very privately, the Secretary of State, in fact, it's almost impossible for him to do it because the Secretary of State cannot travel privately. The way you can convey the president personally and privately is the National Security Advisor, and it has been used that way from time to time. But that's the exception. Seeing ambassadors is another kind of operational mission. Uh, ordinarily, they should be seen at the State Department. But working together, the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor can use ambassadorial meetings to convey a different message back home. If you want to protest something, you call the ambassador in, the assistant secretary uh, reads him the riot act in the State Department, or the secretary maybe. But if you really want to convey something, invite him over to the White House. And his message back home is, my golly, you know, I got this not from the assistant secretary, I got this right from the White House. Those are the kinds of things you can use uh, to emphasize the majesty of the presidency, and it should be used only sparingly. Uh, just a couple of words about organization. I think it's essential that it be loose and flexible to meet the president's habits. If you try to legislate a rigid structure and a president doesn't like it, he will ignore it and set up his own informal system to get the work done the way he wants to do it. Uh, the structure has remained relatively unchanged now for, uh, for about uh, 30 years, but it's never the same. It adjusts to each president and the people around him and the way they like to operate. Uh, organizationally, there are two or three problems that have always been a problem. The first is the integration of economic affairs into a national security structure which was really organized to deal with the Cold War. And we've tried various ways of doing it. I'm not going to talk about it because uh, my friend Bob has, uh, uh, has experimented, I think, with some success uh, on that. And the new group seems to have some other ideas. The other is, is the role of OMB. And I think now, in the post-Cold War world, we have a variety of agencies involved in foreign policy broadly never were before. Uh, when we're working in Kosovo, for example, it's not just the State Department, it's not just defense, it's AID, it's, it's all kinds of things that are involved in putting together a region that has been devastated. We're not used to doing that. And it is an, an intricate melding of different agencies and different little pieces of their budget who 
should oversee this. Uh, nowhere in the charter of the Office of Management and Budget, to my knowledge, is the word policy. And yet, by default, OMB is one of the major policy-making organizations of our government. I think it's time that the policy, when it relates to interagency, be supervised by the NSC. In other words, that OMB, in a sense, work hand in hand with the NSC in these kinds of issues with the policy, not the execution, being supervised by the NSC. Well, there are a lot of other things, but uh, I think the final word is that we have to remember as we look forward, uh, the NSC system has a rich past, but there are no two administrations and no two presidents who are just alike. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Brent. We now turn to Anthony Lay. Tony is distinguished professor at the School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University. Uh, he was the first NSC advisor, as you know, in the, uh, under President Clinton. He served in several administrations in Vietnam as a, as a vice consul on front lines at the time. You're still here. And um, also under Kissinger for the first year, and you're still here, and that took valor. <laughs> and uh, then under Carter, he ran the Policy Planning uh, Council. His latest of several books, I contributed to one some decades ago, I remember, um, is Six Nightmares. He rattles the cages of our national security thinking in a, in a tremendous way, taking us into new areas while the opponents will go for our weaknesses, not our strengths, and he's gotten into this. Uh, how better do we deal with uh, strategic warning, advice, planning, contingency planning, kinds of crises you talked about? And we look forward to your views. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> this is a day replete with once and future national security advisors. I see uh, Bud and uh, others in the room. And uh, I think somewhere in each of there are souls uh, lurks a model of this job uh, that is modeled on a story I remember hearing uh, about McGeorge Bundy. Uh, it was my first day in Washington many, many years ago. And that was the story of a psychiatrist who for some reason ends up at, uh, in heaven after uh, dying and uh, is confronted by St. Peter. Uh, and rather than the questions he was dreading, St. Peter says, please come in immediately rushes him to an observation window uh, and they look in a room and there in the room is a gentleman in a white robes and a white beard uh, walking back and forth saying, do this, do that, do this, now, do that. And the psychiatrist says, my God, what's this? And St. Peter says, oh, we're dreadfully worried. It's God. And he thinks that he's McGeorge Bundy. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for all of the reasons that uh, uh, Brent just said, we need to uh, restrain uh, those impulses. This means that uh, there are many issues to be considered, some very uh, specific, which I won't go into, perhaps we could discuss, of how, as Brent said, uh, the National Security Advisor best can both be an honest broker and an advocate of the uh, policies that he or she believes in. Uh, how do you make sure that real options get to the president, not the uh, nuclear war on the one hand, or uh, humiliating withdrawal on the other, or uh, do what the State Department said uh, in between, but to uh, try to break down uh, the middle one? How do you develop a strategic vision? What size should the NSC staff uh, be? How do you make sure there's an institutional memory as we speak? Uh, now the files are being cleaned out, uh, and uh, just as the files were, have been cleaned out uh, in every switch in administration, something that I think is uh, stupid, although understandable. But I want to take a somewhat broader cut. Uh, Yes, certainly, uh, it is true, as Brent said, and I could not agree more, that every administration is different, every president is different, and the national security structure 
uh, to be adapted to the needs and operating style of the president. But I think more profoundly, as uh, Max and uh, Dick and others were saying also, uh, the structure simply has to fit the substance uh, of a rapidly changing world. The conventional wisdom is that with globalization now, uh, so-called structural issues, uh, economic issues, terrorism, proliferation, uh, et cetera, are increasingly important. Uh, that is absolutely true. But it is not enough, therefore, to simply upgrade the offices that are dealing with them. Our task is to understand how, uh, in fact, these issues are not separate issues, but are more and more deeply integrated with the classic diplomatic geopolitical issues uh, that we are accustomed to dealing with. So we have to break down in our minds conceptually the distinction between those issues and classic issues of diplomacy, including even the distinction between foreign policy issues and domestic issues, uh, which is becoming uh, eroded. Uh, and we have to then break down the bureaucratic boxes in which we put those uh, issues. And as Brent said, the fundamental role of the National Security Council staff uh, is integrative. I would, however, uh, while agreeing with Brent on those points, take a uh, somewhat uh, more expansive view of what the role of the National Security Advisor uh, not just should be, but I believe uh, in a very new era inevitably will be. What's new about this world is not only how the, as I said, the conceptual boxes are breaking down as issues become more integrated, but also the fact that with the communications revolution and with the democratic revolution of the past uh, two decades, both very welcome revolutions, uh, issues, the business of governing uh, has become uh, more politicized. Those two trends then, the integration of issues and the politicization of governing in democracies uh, have, I think, five implications for the subject at hand. Uh, whenever I say there are five things of anything, uh, my students always say, uh, finally he's getting organized. You can see them grabbing their pencils and writing one and waiting expectant expectantly. Uh, and the problem is I always forget number four and five, but I'll try to do uh, better today. First, uh, I think it is inevitable that as these issues become more complex, only the White House can adjudicate among them. The notion that many presidents come in with that lead agencies uh, can mean that a strong cabinet uh, will uh, actually dominate or be able to uh, adjudicate those issues uh, is, is illusory. Uh, any lead agency will increasingly find it difficult to impose its will uh, on the other agencies. If you decide at the beginning that this agency or that agency uh, has control of this issue or that issue, you are prejudging in advance uh, largely the outcome uh, of which agency's interests uh, are most important to a president. And if you wait and decide, as the Carter administration did, uh, who will take the lead uh, on each issue as the issue comes up, uh, it is a recipe for fratricidal uh, warfare, as in the Carter administration. This new national security team is a very strong one. Uh, this uh, new cabinet, uh, national security cabinet, is a very strong one. Parenthetically, I hope they are all uh, confirmed as rapidly as possible. But. For the reasons I said, only the National Security Advisor, working in this case uh, with the Vice President, uh, can uh, pull the issues together. Uh, and only the National Security Advisor uh, can do this on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the Vice President uh, occupied, it appears, elsewhere often. And the National Security Advisor, therefore, in my view, must have the formal authority uh, in the committee structure uh, to do so. If not, our structure will be at war with the substance uh, and there will be a price to be paid. 
Secondly, because of these global realities, this trend is, not, uh, is true not only in the United States, but in other governments as well. And power is gravitating increasingly towards prime ministers at the expense of foreign ministers. And that is why it is increasingly necessary to get work done for national security advisors to be in touch almost on a daily basis with their counterparts uh, in other countries. I inherited a bank of telephones from Brent uh, to uh, his colleagues uh, and passed them along to Sandy. He will be passing them uh, along to Condi. To get the job done, then, national security advisors uh, uh, have to be engaged in diplom diplomacy in a way that was unimaginable 20 years ago. Uh, but, as Brent said, they must do so privately, so as not to undercut the Secretary of State uh, and so as to preserve uh, as much harmony as possible with the Secretary of State. Third, because of the communications revolution, uh, there is an increasing demand uh, by the press on multiple television and uh, stations, uh, especially, uh, for explanations of any uh, foreign policy initiative or crisis. Uh, and that maw uh, simply has to be fed, and it is inevitable that national security advisors uh, will have to do that uh, and do that more uh, than I did. Fourth, with the politicization of uh, everything, uh, for good or ill, I underline the latter, uh, in Washington, it is increasingly necessary for the National Security Advisor to spend a lot of time dealing uh, with the Congress uh, and to do so not only to help the Secretaries of State and Defense and Treasury and others to explain our policies, uh, but also to try to develop the kind of trust that will lead to a diminution of the overwhelming workload that comes from the many, many congressional not just requests, but demands for documents, for explanations, uh, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, the NSC staff uh, is highly overburdened by this now. Uh, and in my view, you cannot cut that staff significantly, although it should be uh, cut as, a, as an ideal, uh, until you have done something about the uh, problem of these congressional uh, demands. Uh, and finally, fifth, uh, <clears throat> because of this politicization, uh, it is increasingly necessary that the National Security Advisor find ways to develop fire breaks between his or her own work uh, and the work of the White House political staff. Um, I didn't have long philosophical discussions with uh, Dick Morris when he was in the uh, White House. Uh, because I tried to, for this reason, see as little of him as possible. But I suspect he never understood that this is not only the right thing, uh, but it is good politics uh, as well. Because if we increasingly get the impression that foreign policy decisions are being made for reasons of domestic politics, uh, it will uh, hurt, the, hurt the president not only in substance, but politically as well. Finally, just two brief uh, points <coughs> about uh, in such a world uh, particular demands on the National Security Advisor. One is that it is increasingly important that the National Security Advisor help the Director of Central Intelligence to uh, focus and to place uh, increasing resources on uh, early warning and dealing with this wide range of new security threats, uh, such as terrorism, uh, transnational crime, et cetera, et cetera, and as George Tennant uh, is trying to do as well as to enhance its capacity uh, to deal with economic issues. Uh, my own view is that CIA will never do a better job at uh, at least immediate economic forecasting than the Treasury Department or uh, Citigroup or uh, others on uh, Wall Street, but it can do a much better job, and it is a vital job, of taking economic forecasting and seeing the consequences uh, for uh, geopolitical uh, issues uh, and helping uh, to integrate then economic uh, and uh, political uh, policies. And secondly, it is uh, vital, and this is much harder than it sounds, that the National Security Advisor take the time, I would try to do it Sunday uh, mornings, 
uh, and Saturdays to step back from the Augean inbox that will fill just as fast as you scoop it out uh, and in which the immediate uh, memo always goes on top of the important memo uh, and to step back uh, and think through strategic planning uh, and to try to develop uh, help the president and the vice president and other colleagues uh, to develop uh, clear strategic uh, goals. I am very skeptical that uh, any administration in this new world can or in fact should uh, develop one bumper sticker strategy that we can all say yes now uh, everything is clear. Uh, it would create a kind of rigidity that is wrong. Although I confess I have a residual affection for a bumper sticker that says democracy and open markets. Uh, but a national security advisor can and must uh, help to define central purposes uh, and clear priorities uh, and then make sure as much as possible that those priorities and purposes are brought to every policy discussion that the president has. I saw in yesterday's New York Times, a uh, piece by David Sanger, uh, that the new administration is working on new ways to integrate uh, the work of the Treasury Department and the National Security Council staff, something, of course, that we did perfectly. I'm just, while you're still nodding, I want to see how long the nodding we, we certainly, go along. We, we certainly uh, did it. <laughs> uh, I remember clearly when Bob Rubin, uh, the new head of the National Economic Council, which I thought was a very good thing, uh, both Bob Rubin and the National uh, Economic <laughs> Council. Uh, and I tried to figure out how to integrate uh, the work with the National Security Council. And based on a precedent from previous administrations, we invented a system together of sharing staff, uh, which would ensure, uh, unless you had uh, schizoid staff members, uh, that each of us would always be included on uh, every memo on international economic issues. And I remember saying to Bob at the end that uh, nobody's ever gotten this right, probably nobody ever will. Uh, it's very difficult to do, but it's the best we can think of, and someday graduate students will write uh, dissertations on how we got it wrong. Uh, and uh, I look forward uh, now to hearing from Bob about uh, how we did. Thank you, well, thank very, you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tony.